Cool. So Charlie, we're just hitting record in our private conversations now. Perfect. Yeah. Like it's the, you know, <laughs> that's this is the nature of our friendship. We have to be recording this for posterity or blackmail or whatever it is. Do you think it's like a 50-50 chance that we hit uh, delete at the end of this? Or? I uh if we do, that means it was a good combo. Okay. <laughs> cool. We'll get to catch up. Yeah, yeah. It's been it's been a couple of weeks, been kind of busy over here. I was just wrist deep clearing some gutters. So I took a shower. Um, I showered for you. Oh, appreciate that. Yeah. Um, you want to chat about the book publishing stuff that we were Yeah. Doing? Yeah. I mean, I've been I've been extolling the virtues of Plutz Press to you for what feels like many years now. And I feel like you're starting to you're starting to get it a little bit. What's uh, yeah? Give me give us all the pitch again. Why is okay. Plutz Press the uh, the pinnacle of publishing? Plutz Press. It's a typically spiral bound book. I guess they cheaped out on this version, but it's a book for kids that teaches you something cool, and typically comes with whatever you need to do it. So there's a book on making friendship bracelets, a book on tying knots, and the knots book comes with two ropes. There was a tabletop football one. And these were things that you would typically get, or you know, if you were lucky, you might get as a gift from maybe a grandparent or some holiday or your birthday. And it would just be this doorway into learning something new. And the best part was that it was written for you. The writing is hilarious. Um, there's all kinds of silliness and jokes. And it was never like talking down to you. It just felt like you were, whoever was writing it was sort of in the muck with you. And it was it made you feel like it's great to be a kid. And as a kid, I get to do all this random weird stuff and maybe I'll get good at this. So I've always loved it. Uh, and it became a thing that in the last couple of years, I found a couple of mine from home. I've been sort of buying them all back up. And so much so that I wrote this whole blog post a couple of years ago because I had discovered that the company motto for Klutz Press was this phrase, create wonderful things, be good, have fun. And I subsequently decided to make that my life's my life's motto and life's work. I don't know exactly what that means. Maybe we can get into that today, but how was that for a pitch? Cause um, I've been saying this for years. Good. I mean, yeah. what, what really resonated with me was when uh, you posted that to Hacker News and I saw everyone chiming in yeah. about how much of an impact particular cloth books had on them as kids, or at least how memorable they were. It's not like they all became jugglers. Like, I guess that's not the point, but it's like, out of out of the blur of childhood stands out this like experience of having achieved this thing through this book that was speaking to them. That's just fantastic. Yeah, it was cool. The okay. John Cassidy, the founder of Klutz, somehow I think he was on some sort of road trip or something. At least that's what he said. Made his way in over to Hacker News and started answering everyone's questions. I think this was his only interaction with Hacker News. He sort of had a unexpected AMA and then drifted away never to deal with hacker news again that is probably the best <laughs> hacker news experience yeah, i can imagine uh but yeah it's it's just cool uh, i don't know that and even the origin story of klutz uh because i've done some digging into cassidy he's uh the company was founded in his palo alto garage which has some nice you know early computer history aesthetic and vibes which is uh -huh. which is cool and he was a river raft instructor sort of bumming around teaching english as well and I think I've never done river rafting, but you spend time on the land as well. And you're sort of camping around a fire. There's not a lot to do. So you probably play cards, you tell tell tales and juggle and juggling juggle. Was you did. So the <laughs> first knots. couple, yeah, yeah, tie knots. That was basically the first 10 years of klutz. It was random stuff you did around the campfire, um, which is just really cool. And so he he packaged it up and I think it was the sort of thing like you didn't want to start a company per se. It wasn't like, oh, I'm going to go off and do this thing. It's just, hey, I've got this teaching style and I've got this nice idea and I can present it in a way that is uh, not talking down to kids and makes them feel empowered. And uh, I don't know, it just it just feels like discovery. It feels like oh, summer reading joy type stuff. So I try to keep them around, um, not always within arm's reach, but usually. That, that to me is what's so fantastic about this and that we should try and take to our publishing project as well. Yes. Uh, I mean, obviously we've, we've discussed this, but for the sake of everyone else listening, yeah. like the, the idea that it is for the kid, like yeah. there's a respect for the, the reader who happens to be a kid probably, uh, 
they we know that they're going to be able to learn this thing we know probably within a few pages they're going to know more than their teachers about this thing that may also be about magnetism or whatever right like yeah, yeah. remember they didn't they partner with uh, martin gardner to do like science magic kind of uh, i think so well? yeah yeah so oh right they it's did not, um... it's not just juggling it's like the kind of thing that they're su supposed to be learning in school too like magnetism ele electricity magnetism or whatever um but uh but because the kid is engaged with the book and is speaking to them um they are going to know more than their teachers in in a few pages yeah um so just like to present it that way actually maybe this is a bit tangential but charlie how many textbooks let's say did you read that you felt were written to you that were addressing you like when you were in school in high school or in university or whatever like you pick up a book you feel like they're actually speaking to you as opposed to like the academic void or whatever. And you're supposed to pick up bits and pieces here and there. I'm obviously zero, but the funny thing with my school, you'd get these hand-me-down textbooks and you sort of hoped that the, your predecessors were um, effective highlighters. Oh then, yeah, they make good notes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah I remember exactly. like so, the circulating uh, student note market where like <laughs> there's someone else, <laughs> your peers notes on the textbook were worth more than the textbook. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I also had this experience of, um, so I majored in mathematics. I don't know if you know that, but uh, I majored in math. I, and I assumed. I, I did, uh, I did like quite a bit of abstract algebra, mm -hmm. um, but like, you know, some of it I picked up, some of it I struggled with and um, ultimately didn't go down that path, obviously. Um, but I came back to abstract algebra just because I was interested. And um, in the course of this, uh, encountered one book called Abstract Algebra, a Student-Friendly Approach. Okay. And it's pretty introductory and like, you know, I, I knew the stuff, so I was, I was pretty comfortable with it, but I worked through the book and the presentation of the book is um, kind of like Little Schema insofar as there's like a question and answer. It's not as committed to the question and answer format as Little Schema is, yeah. but it's basically like here are a sequence of questions and some supporting explanatory material where if you were to work through it in this order, uh, then you will, and it's, you know, it's written in second person. Like if you, uh, if, you, Me. if you were to, if you were to answer those questions, then you will understand this. And it's just totally different to the standard way of teaching anything, let alone abstract algebra, and you learn abstract algebra. And it's like, it has it in the name, abstract algebra, a student-friendly approach. And yeah. the moment you read that, you're like, Shouldn't everything be a student-friendly approach? Like, aren't these books for the students? So why are they not? Why do people write them in this sort of staid, boring way? Is it just, is it easier? I think part of it is like an academic tradition. Okay. Um, it's like, part of it is maybe you're writing for peers, you're writing for the people who make the purchasing decisions when you get into certain parts of academic uh, textbook pub publishing. Um, you're writing for your editor at Pearson or whatever. Yeah, yeah um and they're writing for the like the department or it's like the you've probably never seen this movie the plot of hook when peter pan forgets childhood and he's a grown person and he's in the corporate world now and he's forgotten tinkerbell and everyone so much, so much of teaching is like that yeah, yeah so much of teaching is like i mean that's why a lot of the time the tas like you learn more from the tas or your peers and and we we're just talking about that in relation to like uh, sharing notes and highlighting and whatever. Yeah, your peers uh, are better at speaking to you about that kind of thing. So, yeah, I I did remember some courses in college where I felt just to play with the other direction. I felt like this lecture had been given for twenty years, and that also was kind of cool to me. Uh, so it wasn't necessarily for me, but I felt like yeah. I was hearing maybe that's the sort of arcane knowledge type appeal to some of this stuff. So even if it's the same thing, I now have access to this, but that doesn't mean I actually learned it. It was maybe more of a just, uh, this is interesting, but it didn't actually teach me the topic. Yeah, I think there's value. There's value in both. I mean, for, for me, I've gotten better and better at learning by myself, like mm. literally uh, teaching myself. And I, I think a lot of people in computer science are doing exactly that. I mean, something like a million people a year on Teach Yourself CS. Uh, and, wow. um, and, uh, so there's that, uh, there's like trying to learn off the greats, whether that's a textbook or like Andrew Ng's Coursera course or whatever. Yeah. Um, and then there's like this, uh, this spectrum of 
community peer you know whether it's reddit or your buddy with whom you're doing this or like a classroom uh where you're all getting the same degree like there's that spectrum there as well yeah. i think being able to navigate all of those is uh, is worthwhile yeah but it definitely didn't feel that with those books growing up and we were even chatting about the workbooks that you would get would be the companion to the textbook and they were even worse because you just get this slim volume that you know is just homework you, I'm yeah. going to suffer through this and I'm going to mark this up. I'm not going to like any of it. I'm going to be racing so I can go watch Dragon Ball Z after this or whatever it was after school. Yeah, it's an afterthought um, yeah. a lot of the time. I mean, sometimes it's written by a different person. Like you have this amazing person write the textbook and yeah. then they're like, I'm done. I've spent all my energy on this, on the expository material. Someone else can figure out the challenges, the exercises. Or like a great example of this is um, Computer Systems, a programmer's perspective, where it's a fantastic mm -hmm. book. It's, it's really the best textbook in, on that topic. Uh, like I've just had a lot of students have a lot. Um, and the exercises and labs that those guys teach at CMU are also fantastic. Mm -hmm. Um, like, uh, there's this, um, you know, there's a, the kind of standard malloc and shell implementation labs, but there's also this one where you like have to do this re reverse engineering to diffuse a bomb that's going to explode and stuff. Sweet. And they've got auto grading and it's just really good stuff. Okay. And then their book has pretty good exercises, but not comparable to the labs that they teach yeah. in there in, at CMU, but then the international edition of the book whatever reason has just like balked exercises just mm. like terrible exercises incorrect solutions to the point where the original authors have have a note on their website being like Don't buy this. please be aware the international edition has terrible exercises uh i don't like how did that happen in publishing i don't know thank you thank you publisher oh man it, it's kind of like the celeron uh do you know the story it's like no, uh, is that what is that a computer chip yeah, yeah, it's an Intel. Yeah. It was like the Pentium. Did you have a Pentium? I had a Pentium. A... That was a that was a big day. That yeah, day. yeah. I'm pretty sure. Next. I haven't verified this, but I'm yeah. pretty sure that the way that Intel uh, did price discrimination, uh, you know, you know about the concept of price discrimination. Like you, you basically no. the ideal. I mean, like, I should. I studied pricing, economics, but yeah. The, the the ideal pricing model is to like, you know, if you could, uh, if you could guess the price that someone is willing to pay and offer them exactly that price mm. for your textbook or whatever and do that for every individual person that would be the optimal right it's like they're just willing to pay this much money yeah. for the book and someone else is willing to pay that much money for the book uh and you're still going to make a profit so you'll still sell it to them like that would be ideal yeah but you can't do that realistically so a lot of the time people will have like a kind of fake premium uh, or like you're buying a car and you pay extra for the badge or for some like trim that costs you not very much more, but yeah. but cost the, the customer much more because they are willing to pay more. That's price discrimination. Got it. Basically. Okay. I was thinking so the way the... Intel did price discrimination, please someone fact check this because it's like uh, just something that I picked up somewhere. But I think that the Celeron was basically a a a not very good <laughs> Pentium where like you fab the chips and you test them and like there, there are some defects yeah and um and so it ends up being like it's still correct but slower or something yeah it's get to be celerons nice. or maybe like it's, it's just fabricated in a way where it's like intentionally broken uh in a way like uh, uh retarded in a way like I mean, yeah I'm retarded in a way yeah uh that's the celeron wow and anyway, so they just came up with that they came up with a brand the for the yeah. Okay. That's rough. I was thinking of the price discrimination, which is not the exact analogy here, but it's like sort of in the other direction, which is that Radiohead album, which was the one of the first, remember in Rainbows that came out maybe 2010. And it was pay, the first thing I saw, which was pay whatever you want for this album. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And I paid zero and I later bought it on <laughs> vinyl, but I, I paid zero and I loved it. Um, but yeah, I th maybe some people paid them hundreds of dollars. I don't know. Yeah, that happens a little bit with um, uh, Kickstarter campaigns yeah. and um, Substacks and stuff. Oh, I was going to ask. Yeah, long story short, what, what we're talking about is like very few people are starting from the question of what is going to be most effective for them. It's actually, it's actually hard. And if you are an expert 
on a topic, you've already invested so much of your intellectual energy on being an expert at that topic. It is highly unlikely that you're also investing a lot of intellectual energy in being good at conveying that topic to newcomers. Um, There is this kind of conflict. And so, you know, that's why I resist the temptation to be an expert on a topic. Uh, That's my cop out. Uh, No, like the the, it's very rare to have people. And obviously there are some people like this as well. um, uh, But they're very rare to have individuals who can be world-class at a topic and uh, also world-class at teaching that thing. And so I think a lot of the time the textbook just the exercise and so so on yeah well this this makes me this makes me think i feel like we were talking about this the other day that you're down on the idea of the young ladies illustrated primer so i'm just curious your thoughts on text the next generation of textbooks where anki and spaced repetition is built in but you did i think you're my read is that you're not bullish on people tackling this illustrated primer model for textbooks can you talk about that like where you I think, think that's a little yeah. bit of a, a different problem that I have um, okay. with that. I mean, what, what I'm responding to is that a lot of people see how surprisingly successful LLMs are at some tasks. Yeah. And they say, hey, like, well, I read sci-fi. Uh, I, <laughs> I have this brilliant idea that maybe we can actualize this. I mean, really a plot device um, in the Diamond Age for people who are not yeah we'll try and do this without spoilers it's 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 worth reading this book yeah, even just to understand what's in the zeitgeist i think uh the neil sealants and uh yeah. novel uh, the diamond age um but uh <clears throat> excuse me in this book there's this really a, a narrative device a, a, like an interactive book that teaches the protagonist a bunch of things kind of responsibly <laughs> oh, excuse me do you want to take over while i mute myself and cough yeah 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 This is when um, in Wayne's world, there's this moment when Garth is, yeah, he's dying. Garth is in front of the screen and Wayne's not there. And he's like, I'm having a good time, not. Uh, This is a a heavily quoted phrase in my household. Have you seen that movie? Probably not. Wayne's world? I've not. No, of course not. Someone out there has. (laughs) Um, Are you all right? Are you all right over there? Yeah, I'm fine. I made it this time. Uh, it would be funny if I died on air. Yeah, <laughs> the, au- the audio uh, folks wouldn't have uh, wouldn't have gotten to enjoy that unless I just narrated it after. But the the YouTubers would have enjoyed that. Um, the um, Diamond Age. The thing that I was saying, what I don't like, what what I'm seeing right right now is a lot of people just trying to prompt hack their way to a universal interface for learning. Mm -hmm. where they're like hey i have a custom gpt which will teach you anything you want and this is the extent of their creative use of llms in education it's like i'm giving you a universal interface that adapts to you or whatever uh in the same way that the young ladies illustrated primer does and it's just not it's just not going to work um even the best human tutors cannot do that effectively across different topics and you want to see an llm as being like third quartile at everything uh or you know second quartile at some things um and uh you know not not world class at everything so so can i just can i press on that let's say theoretically you could feed the corpus of klutz press into an llm and then you said hey generate me a klutz book or at least a chapter on teaching me something completely random. I don't know, like pogo sticking. You don't think that would be possible? Would it just, is it because of hallucinations and it would just teach you something completely random? What would be the problem? I think if you were Klutz Press, you would still go to the effort of finding the person to write the book yeah. yourself. And you just wouldn't bother generating the output of that. Yeah. Because in publishing, like you get a good book and you publish that and a lot of people have it and like it's worth making the effort to, to have it be you know first quartile or like 99th percentile mm. um uh, let alone like reasonably good llms do well at the reasonably good task not at the like the world-class task 
What about forget LLMs, but just spaced repetition? Should textbooks be, if you make an online textbook, should it just be built in that you're constantly flashcarding things? Would that be a direction you think? Like you should the go? quantum country kind of thing? Quantum, yeah, exactly. The Michael Nielsen project. Um, I think it's, I think they can be neat. Yeah. Uh, I think, yeah, like I like execute program um, for yeah. that. What So what I like in execute program in particular one country, I guess, also decently well, but particularly um, this is Gary Bernhardt's uh, executeprogram.com. Yeah, I've, I've played with what it. I, I like it. What I like about that is that the topics fit the style of learning, mm. right? Like if the topic is uh, JavaScript array methods or something, yeah, which is the one I remember doing, then that's great. Like if that's what you want to learn, then there, there is memorization there. And it is nice to be able to just load that into your brain and to have the questions be kind of adaptive a little bit, like not just, you, you know, um, avoid the failure mode of you memorizing the numbers and instead they're a bit of a template. Yeah. Um, then that's something that you can't just do by writing your own Anki cards. Uh, and so that kind of thing is a great fit for that. W what is problematic is then if you say, well, let's extend this to all of programming which is not about memorization, uh, that, that is where you start to fail, let alone all of computer science or all of uh, knowledge. There are so many other modes of understanding things yeah. where memorization is just a piece of it. Uh, and so that's, that's what, like, what I really like about Execute Program is that Gary has fit the topics to this, the style of teaching them. So yeah. I want I want to see thousands, millions of those where you're like, what is that that we're trying to teach? How is the person who's trying to learn this going to learn it? What is the best way to do that? What is the feedback loop? Uh, is it about being prompted to to re recall this thing? Well, then maybe we should prompt them to recall things. Yeah. Uh, on a schedule, <laughs> that's when you end up. You know, you back your way into spaced repetition there. Yeah. Um, but it, what, what I don't like about the space, rep, space repetition scene is that there are a lot of people who've seen the value of space repetition for certain things and they try and extend it everywhere. And maybe actually they do a reasonably good job for themselves at like misappropriating or like adapting it to other things. But yeah. if they were to start from the problem, this is polio again, like the problem is helping someone learn a topic I could maybe extend my use of Anki cards to cover that topic somewhat well, but like as a general solution to this problem, do we end up at space repetition as the best kind of feedback loop? Probably not for, for most problems. Yeah. So that's, that's my disappointment with that, the space repetition scene. Obviously it's, it's, it's very good at certain things. Like if I needed to learn Japanese or something, well, actually, if I really need to learn it, it's going to be full immersion you know right away right but if but if there's there are certain things like i become a med student of course i'm going to use anki like yeah. i'd be crazy not to use anki yeah, as yeah. A med student. um but uh there are other things where like i try to adapt it to things that i want to well learn. it feels like, certainly anything that feels that you have to digitally with your hands and fingers i feel like you have to have some practical component it's good to have the knowledge it's you know every movie has the book smart person and then they're thrown into the field and then they don't know what to do and maybe some of that's just psychological or um your adrenaline getting to you but i'm the example i was thinking of was learning to make a fire with i don't know a bow whatever that thing yeah, is. you know yeah. i can read an anki card about that but it's probably pretty hard to learn how to do that when i'm when i'm freezing and my hands are chattering and i haven't done this before yeah, I mean, there are people in the jujitsu. Jujitsu is a really interesting community because a lot of us are like very nerdy, yeah. and we're trying. We're and we're very uh, conscious about um, uh, learning me methods. Like, there's that like metacognitive aspect to jujitsu practice that isn't in some other sports. Um, for whatever reason, we just get nerd sniped. Uh, we we just love complexity. <laughs> we're just drawn to complexity, I guess. Anyway, there are some people who use Anki cards in jiu-jitsu. And it's yeah. like, okay, there's some, there's some value in that, I guess. If you're very good at Anki, you may actually support your learning somewhat better. Obviously, it's not. Like, if you make a, a list of the top 100 things that you could do to be better at jiu-jitsu, it's unlikely that making Anki cards is in there. Yeah. If, if you start from that point, I think Anki comes up very rarely. But if you're good at Anki, then maybe extending that to cover some of your understanding is not, is not bad. Yeah.
So I just to, yeah, sorry. Go I was just saying to kind of circle to the idea that you and I have been discussing in publishing. One one thought I had that could prompt this was it seems like there's an observation that maybe there are these there are textbooks like the one you mentioned, the abstract algebra, et cetera, that have been written and are just undis like out of print and you can't find them anymore. So some of what we've been talking about is the using the analogy of Stripe Press, that there are these great texts out there that are obscure that no one knows about that if you try to buy it could cost $400 on a yeah. books or something like that. So just talk to me about that. Your, your position that you think that a lot of these things are out there and, and just not easy to access right now. Yeah. Sometimes there, there is a, there is a book like this that I find and I end mm -hmm. up finding it on a blog or something. And then I, I, the only copy I can find is on a scan on Internet Archive. Yeah. So a concrete example of this is Let's Play Geometry, which was uh, published by Mir, which is a publisher, a Soviet uh, publisher. I don't know if they're still around in some manifestation or not, but their heyday was like the also the heyday of like optimism around space, science, mathematics yeah. and space yeah, in yeah. particular. Yeah. And there are just some fantastic titles, and it's for for all for all ages. Um, uh, you know, some some re really clearly written for kids, and others, you know, for teenagers, and some for adults. But a lot of them are just fantastic. Uh, I just like embodies the optimism of that era that I love. Yeah. But yeah, let's play geometry is a concrete example of that. I, I do a little bit with my my oldest kid, and we printed it out and bound it ourselves. Yeah. Um, and it's like a, you know, a conversational cartoony book. Um, there's like a Pinocchio character and stuff. Uh, and, um, uh, but the drawing dots and lines and making shapes and seeing that out in the world. And it's like great Soviet era art. Um, yeah. But also it's just like, it's like, well, here are two dots on a page. Now you draw a line. Oh, is it a straight line? Is it still a line if it's not straight or whatever? It's, it's just like, it, it uh, is interactive with the kid yeah. now if you want a copy of this book good luck like i don't know what it takes to buy a physical copy of this book now um you know you can print it yourself from a scan on internet archive i guess but wouldn't it be nice if someone was printing these again yeah um and maybe you could say hey look if you did it again from scratch for a modern audience it would look different and wouldn't like, it would it be an ipad app where you can just yeah open, maybe open that app would be better and the, you know there is good interactive geometry stuff as well um but if the easier path uh is to like find how to do a reprint run of this and to find how to promote this well and to get that in the hands of ten thousand uh, kids um rather than like having to write a book from scratch and illustrate that from scratch and that be a year-long process and investing more uh maybe you and i should just print it like you uh, yeah we should just get the rights and print it yeah. um so there's that and then um i've been obsessed recently with uh mitsumasa ano um uh, whose books yeah, these, are these are so cool yeah, yeah just like beautifully illustrated it's a little bit different um it's not i mean it's still interactive he's still speaking to the kid sometimes just through illustrations like sometimes intentionally no words um, but sometimes there are some some verbal prompts as well, but it's like it is in the second person. Uh it is um like actually should we should we bring some up in yeah, yeah, our, let's do it. We're gonna violate everyone's copyright if we do that. Uh well it's it's on Internet Archive, right? Yeah, I guess it's I guess it's their fault. We're just going <laughs> to a website. Gets, gets yanked by YouTube. Wait, let me bring it up first so that I don't incriminate myself accidentally. Okay. I've been chrome. But the um, but the Stripe Press analogy here is okay. Uh, the Carlson brothers knew about the Licklider book, and no one could get access to this. And it's a similar yeah, exactly yeah yeah the Licklider book, the Hamming book. These are fantastic yeah. books. Um, and when they were promoting them, um, they like uh, Patrick Collison in particular wanted everyone to read uh, Dream Machine. Yeah. And you could get it, um, but it was starting to get expensive. And actually, the more they promoted it, the more expensive yeah, yeah. it got um, because of just the limited supply. And so if they could find the, get the publishing rights, uh, which they did, then they could start uh, selling it for actually quite cheap. It's very, uh, very accessible. Um, and 
Sorry, this is me failing. So yeah, yeah. To bring up Mitsumasa. The, like, the accessible but, thing is key too. That's like a klutz press thing. When you talk to Cassidy or in his limited interviews, his he said every book is less than twenty dollars, which is really important to them. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah. So we got to figure out if anyone listening is in publishing and wants to give us a crash course Please. in how to actually do this kind of thing, like what it takes to do a reprint run of a book like that, then uh, then let me know. Um, so this is Mitsumasa Ano. Uh, you know, I know most people listening here are not seven, uh, but <laughs> uh, if you've got kids or you want to feel like a kid for a moment or just like be immersed in someone else's world um, for uh, for uh, five minutes, then the Mitsumasa Ano books are, are fantastic. Actually, this illustration, my kids were cracking up at this for like 10 minutes straight last night this okay. is in, it's uh this is like a um impossible staircase yeah yeah it's yeah. uh it's out of a book called topsy turvies okay and this is one of his earlier books and uh, award-winning like this is when he got international recognition i think um but like at first i looked at it and didn't see much of it and then we started counting the levels it's like this is level one Okay, so you go up the stairs to level two, and then you go up the stairs two, and then they just lost it. They just lost control. And it, <laughs> like it was, it was weird for me to experience that. It's like it's not that funny, guys. Yeah. Uh, but Mitsumasa, I don't know. He knew it was funny. That, he knew it was. That it was, yeah. yeah, yeah. And so Topsy Turvies is just it's just illustrated. Yeah. There are no words, and uh, it's just scenarios like this, um, just to like get prompt, prompt some like creative thinking or something um so what happened like notes. something like this is lovely this is a beautiful book why did it fade away what happened i mean there's probably a unique story for every one of these like the mirror publishing i don't know the soviet union ended maybe that had an impact on mirror but what do you think happened well, my, to anno's books my understanding based on five minutes of research is that this was originally published in english by a publisher that had some fantastic titles, something like a dozen plus of Mitsumasa Anos, but also some early Eric Carl books and some other mm -hmm. great stuff. Um, and maybe even The Very Hungry Caterpillar. Um, but uh, they did fantastically at selecting these kinds of books yeah. and then got acquired. I think that's what happened. Yeah. Um, if anyone listening knows the story, please uh, let me know or feels like investigating the story, please let me know. But I think that's it. And I think that some big name publisher <laughs> they won't mention uh, it has the has the publishing rights and they just couldn't be bothered. And they're, okay. they're publishing a bunch of other stuff instead. Um, well, Hungry Caterpillar what... persists to this day. So they, it seems like yeah. They, yeah, they pick some yeah. holdovers. So anyway, I mean, this counting, I know this counting book is, is still very widely uh, uh, circulated, printed. Um, so that's still in print, um, but there's a bunch of other stuff in here that's not, and some of them sadly are becoming collector's items, which is just like pushing up the prices quite a lot. So Socrates and the Three Little Pigs is an example of this. Yeah. It's just like, you know, it's expensive if you want a, a copy. Um, some others are very good, and maybe let's bring up, let's see, Internet Archives. Uh, and I think Anos Hats is maybe a good example of this. Mm -hmm. Oh, Anna's hat tricks, that's what it is. So let's see if the Internet Archive is going to let us see this without horror. Logging in, yeah. Anna. Limited preview. I know, huh? Come on. Are they going to mask it? Well, I'm trying to uh, I'm trying to stay incognito here. Yeah. Let's see, can I do this? I'll take this off screen. Okay. It went, yeah, that was fast. You're gonna have you may have a lot of emails on your Gmail account right now. I know, I know. Yeah. Oh, that's all right. My but that's uh, like my I, if you account. if you want to email a celebrity, like there's probably a good chance the celebrity is their name at Gmail. Yeah. <laughs> or well, this is my birth name though, which I don't use. So oh yeah. Okay. Maybe it's a little bit harder, but it is published on my website. Yeah. You can email me. I like emails. Okay. Uh, let's see here. Now I got to do this two-factor auth. Okay. As you're doing this, I'm one of the other things about Stripe Press 
they've obviously done an amazing job packaging and printing them and making them feel beautiful objects. And for me, a big part, I want, I want to work on something where a kid feels like they're building their own personal library in some way. So some of that can be fostered by the parents and they just sort of make this available. But I love the idea of a kid building their arsenal of books that they love. So I do feel like packaging them in a nice way. Not that the versions I'm seeing here aren't beautiful, but I wonder what we could do there. And Klutz's angle was everything should be spiral bound or at least printed in a way that you can hold both sides open and it can lay flat. Yeah. Um, I, I, you know, that's just aesthetic thing, but I feel like that would be really cool. I want, my idea is you're under a blanket, you've got a flashlight and you've got your yeah. book laying flat underneath you. That's the, that's the vibes I want. Yeah. Even just usable books, doable books. Yeah. You can tear out the pages. You can, yeah. you know, they're designed to be drawn on and stuff. Yeah. Um, so this is hat tricks. What I, oh, I got to actually click borrow as well. Okay. Now we're borrowing it. Now it's legit. Are we allowed okay. to borrow it and do a reading on YouTube? I don't, I don't know. Let's see if we get a takedown. This will be the first, the CS yeah, yeah. takedown notice. All right, you're spoiling okay. it. You're going from the back. Oh, sorry. Yeah. All right. Maybe this is fine. Yeah. All right. So. Firstly, illustrations, beautiful. Like mm -hmm. this, this is kind of the motivation to try and do some reprinting rather than just commission new work. Yeah. It's like uh, really, really nicely done. Uh, and uh, now secondly, like you are present. You, the reader, are present as a shadow. Oh, cool. Like, this is your shadow. Uh, so then you are asked questions. You, the shadow, the person who casts the shadow, I guess. Shadow Child. Shadow Child. And it's saying, sure. okay, we asked Tom, what's the color of your hat? Tom doesn't know. Oh, wait. To be clear, we have uh, three red hats and two white hats at this point. He's he's built up to this. So I'm yeah, just jumping. Yeah. This is like that I'm Khan Academy. Me. Did you ever do that Khan Academy brain teaser with the aliens and the people in the hats and everything and the different color hats? No, I didn't. Maybe it's I'm, inspired by this. Oh, one. it's so good. Yeah. Anyway. Uh so yeah, three uh three red, two whites. Uh, Tom doesn't know what color his hat is. Uh Hannah doesn't know either. So Shadow Child, do you know the color of your hat? Like your presence in the book, right? Yeah. This is like uh uh abstract algebra student friendly approach, just for yeah. like introductory logic for seven year olds. Like you're right there. And now I love that. Ask yourself. Uh, so this kind of thing and like building up one problem at a time, and it gets hard by the end. Like he, oh, he keeps red. going. Yeah. He, he keeps. Sorry, did I spoil it? <laughs> <laughs> no, but that's. I mean, look at that. Look at that binary tree over there. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. So this this kind of thing. It's it's a shame that there are more copies around. Basically, it's a shame yeah. that they're not printing it right now. It'd be nice to nice to have that. Um, or so, like we we commission work like this. Yeah. It just feels like maybe you know since you and I have other things that we do in our time. Uh, and that's the thing. I I want to experiment with this in some way. I want to see if we can do some limited run. You know, learn about print on demand, or maybe we have to do like something more complicated if we want cool binding. I want to go through that experience because I feel as if the experience of getting rights, that's its own adventure. And we should we should figure that out because I do believe in this mission. But I also wonder maybe we could write one ourselves. It you know may not be of the, you know, it probably won't be of the caliber of Anos, but that could at least get us in the flow in an experimental way. Because you know, Stripe Press does commission books, they find authors, they find things. So we could explore both avenues at the same time. Um I don't know. I I, I want to make some progress on this. I, I like your call out to see if anyone has any ideas about the, the right side. That would be great. Yeah. Uh, but maybe we need to dig in and see what the two of us could come up with if we wanted to do a, a small version of this ourselves. Do you want to test the printing thing in particular? Or, sh or do you think it'd be easier to make it as an interactive uh, iPad app or something? I'm probably it would be easier to make it interactive, but I haven't done too much interactivity in some way. Like um, we could probably figure that out and we wouldn't have to deal Apparently with it. Apparently EPUB, you just do CSS animation. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, we could try both. 
I like the idea of printing it. I just, I like physical books. I am surrounded by books. Um, and to hearken back to that thing we were talking about, getting those klutz books, I still just remember moments in the library where I hold off or my mom pulls off something and gives it to me and it just unlocked this whole world. I, the physicality of it is something that's really important to me. So I do want to try the print thing. Yeah. Yeah, I'm with you. I mean, that's why okay. we published it. Why, why, sorry, we printed out Let's Play Geometry and bound it and stuff. Yeah. So we could actually have that, particularly so that you can draw on it. But like, yeah. I just didn't didn't get that much out of looking at it on the screen. Cool. Well, this, Oz, this is broadly part of a, a thing that you had posted the other day. I don't know if you've shared it, but just this idea of finding people to collaborate on yeah. um, different projects. But do you want to talk about that at all? I feel like I've raised my hand at least about this one, but... I don't know, this idea of the things you're interested in and just chatting with people and brainstorming is really fun. Yeah, I can uh, I can share this. Maybe okay. this is just a kind of call out, extended call out for those who are looking at the screen. So, <laughs> I mean, obviously I'm working on CS Primer. This is a CS Primer show. I'm about one year into the project and it's probably going to take three years total, I'm realizing, yeah, um, to get it to the standard that I want across all the topics that I want um and i'm gonna do it like it's the most important thing for me to do but it is a little bit isolating because it is a long solo project and i've got a lot of respect for people who can do that yeah. uh, uh for writers and so on and um i'm, I'm doing okay but it's, it's nice to have some some uh, human interaction from time to time and this is why you agreed to do this do. with me uh yeah thank you so lonely yeah maybe we wouldn't have started this <laughs> uh and also there's just like i i'm i'm realizing about myself that i like a little i like to be a little bit overcommitted. Yeah. uh i like to have a little bit too much going on i just feel better as a person if 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 it's a bit manic like yeah. that other people get stressed out about i'm like bring it on this is boom 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 yeah yeah that was that's yeah, been yeah. my day today and i've been having a great day so yeah, I wish I'd understood that about myself earlier. Like some people like to be narrow in their focus. Uh, I do go narrow focus at, at at times, but like if you tell me, hey, you need to drop everything and just like clean the house until it's 100% clean, that's a nightmare for me. Whereas if you're like, you have 10 responsibilities today and just do as yeah. much of each of them, like the more you do, the better. Yeah. I'm going to do better on average, like across all the days. Anyway, long story short, okay. uh, I, I wrote this up as just like, it's like a subset of the the ideas, the projects list that I'm sure everyone listening has in a Google yeah. Doc, uh, like side project ideas yeah. that I thought might be amenable to um, working with other people as just the, like a bat signal to see, you know, yeah. who, who gets it and uh, feels like reaching out. And honestly, a lot of it is just like, if you come to me with energy about anything that's like somewhat related to this, I'd be interested in in trying something cool. with you. You bring cool. some of the energy, let's do this. Uh, and a lot of them are, 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 are related to what we've been talking about as a kind of press for kids' books, books that speak to the child. Really. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, a bit of a, a kind of extra twist. So what is here there's a lot of like 17th century science that i'm like i wish people had more exposure to this stuff i love 17th century science. Like, are you talking about leeches and things like that or uh well like th things like this demotocordis where it's like we for the first time have a good sense of circulation in the body like a good yeah. hypothesis for circulation in the body because th just this period of science is like now uh, we are dispelling long-held notions about how the world works in very simple ways. It's not like the fancy, sophisticated, uh, like well-funded lab science of today, which is unapproachable. Mm -hmm. Very, I mean, it's just like even I remember I was trying to do some work. I I tried to um for my undergrad physics do some lab work to like test out of the uh experimental uh, uh physics work that i was doing yeah. and i show up at the lab and they have this multi-million dollar machine and the there's a there's a big team and it's like for, for my like finding a way to work here make a contribution just felt impossible anyway 
Yeah. 17th century, the 17th century science stuff is approachable for kids because they don't need the fancy instruments. You can give them a prism, a magnet, whatever. Well, this looks uh, like you give them a give them a tourniquet and then see what happens yeah, yeah. with the veins is what this looks like. Well, this one like uh feels like it should be a video game because uh and for those listening, this is uh Harvey's 1628 Motocorus, which is really like uh, trying to get an understanding of the body that is well beyond Galen, uh, which is just like, you know, everyone just respects Galen or you know, whatever Galen thought about uh, about how the body works was just what was assumed about how the body worked. And uh, Harvey just did some like back of the envelope calculation. And he was like, look, it doesn't actually make sense that blood would be created in the liver because just look at the volume of blood that would have to be created uh for and so it makes more sense if for instance the heart circulated the existing blood and oxygenated it and uh, just kind of demonstrated this cool. through really simple arithmetic that a that a, a child could understand um and a lot of these things and this is a fantastic uh, illustration for that a lot yeah. of these things are just like well try this input and you'll get this output and you can see for yourself you don't need a fancy instrument you don't need an x-ray machine this is just like an understanding of the body. Anyway. Well, so the, the best thing for me on this was magic school bus. If I think about anatomy, the, like the only thing I know about anatomy is when Miss Frizzle drove her bus into the human body and it was just kind of red and gross. But uh, if I went back, probably everything I believe about the human body is based on that one episode. <laughs> well, yeah, there are different, uh, different ways of um, yeah. storytelling, I guess, about this. And what I really like is the historical motivation. Yeah. Uh, yeah, definitely. Where, and I think you could tell a story here of like, yeah, what did I say? Defeating the ghost of Galen. Uh, it's like um, the storytelling of where we were as humanity in this situation, like in this, uh, like what, what I think you could also convey through the historical storytelling aspect is the, um, the understanding of how human progress evolves, like how we have, uh, scientific progress so just increases in our understanding as as all of us as people and we're yeah. currently wrong as well about things like yeah. you're not just getting the final word on how the human body works it's an ongoing process like there's a lot that we don't understand about medicine and you're going to be part of pushing it forward maybe um uh, so Probably. seeing like this this kind of thing the updating of understanding in a way that's approachable is really appealing to me that's to that's on the same vein of telling a kid everything around you was created by people this exactly. bridge was created by someone and then just if these weren't fixed things in time they were created by humans for sure for sure yeah. and they got it wrong look at these bridge collapses and maybe that bridge will collapse yeah. right yeah uh, that stuff's fantastic for kids i think anyway yeah. so i've i've got a bunch of ideas here which are like um yeah the multiple of this i think would do well as a computer game just because some of them are like um vivisection uh yeah. where you, you know you don't really want a kid to dissect a live pig. Uh, but, but but other ones are just like, if you have a magnet or if you have some amber, right, and that's Gilbert's book now, um, then you could do these experiments. And, you know, I think that Klotz's uh, magnetism book and um, uh, Martin Gardner's actually like science magic book are examples of this as well of speaking to the child and having that interactivity but i like the historical context again yeah. because it in that, in that process so basically the idea for this one would be to have a book that has effectively gilbert's um process of understanding magnetism and he does lots of fun stuff just like dispelling uh notions of like how magnets would work i don't know under i want to do this one i think this could be one of our one of our published books um did klutz do a magnet one did you see did they you did yeah yeah okay. yeah yeah they did they, right. they did like uh electricity and magnetism we should, okay. we should get that and check that out all right yeah i'm on it okay but like it's i think it's fine again going back to our conversation of like there's no one young lady's illustrated primer yeah there's, it's like different books are going to speak to different kids and i think having the the historical narrative as part of that um is going to be a valuable appealing for some kids and some kids yep. are going to like the hocus pocus aspect, the whiz bang aspect of um, of Mon Gardner's books. 
Yeah. I mean, they're still going to sell, I don't know if he sold a hundred thousand copies of that and close to a million copies of that. It's a great book. Um, we should have, just... once they do find that room temperature, superconductor, we could do a book <laughs> on that. That would be kind of nice. Make your own. Yeah. For yeah. Sure. Yeah. Um, so that, yeah, so there's that kind of thing. Micrographia is in that vein as well. This is, okay. this would just, I think be a fantastic, uh, uh, oh, yeah, experience that... for a kid. Cause it's like recreating the imagine doing that for the first time like you're looking at these things for the very first time through yeah. the very first microscope and illustrating it and this is what kickstarted the royal society by the way this was their first publication really yeah. yeah cool uh so i mean i just wanted a copy of the book by the way and like the pr the print quality is really poor on the copies that you can get yeah and it doesn't have these kinds of like uh, fold outs out and stuff yeah, yeah. Um, like, man, i just i just it astounds me that they were able to typeset these things back then or you know even early 20th century and have these fold outs and things like that and now we're getting i order a book it's like printed in nevada by amazon and it's complete garbage yeah 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 there are some people who still put in the effort for this but yeah. it's like i guess the accessibility is the trade-off this was not yeah, an accessible book at that's fair uh yeah now now even if you're paying a hundred bucks for a well-printed book that's way more accessible yeah if we're gonna try and get it down to ten ten dollars uh or a dollar now we're talking ipad apps yeah so that's that's the that's the spectrum i am looking uh as i'm looking at the clock here we may have oh, to yeah. we may have to re return to the bottom half of this but i also will link to it if uh We'll we'll keep the rest as a exercise for the. I'm week. not going to go one by one like uh, okay. showing you a family photo album of. <laughs> They're all good ideas. Um, Thanks. Cool. Okay. Well, let's meet again on the book stuff. Okay. Cool. Okay. Yeah. Let, let's catch wait. Up. No, stop recording now, and then let's talk about the super secret stuff. Okay. Oh yeah. All right. <laughs> oh, I'm, do I hit leave? Yeah, I hit leave. <laughs>